The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship with the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. If you are a first time visitor, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Elizabeth Lott and I have been the pastor here for the past decade. And today is my final Sunday in this beautiful place. So welcome to worship with us. Those of you here in the pews, people from Ooh, 25 years ago in my life, all the way to this present moment. It is good to be here with you in this place. All of you on Zoom, thank you for joining us today from all the places where you are. I invite you to join with me in reading our call to worship printed before you. I will begin in the light print and you join me in the bold. The vine emerges from the earth, nourished and nourishing rises without visible connection, roots hidden, promise unknown. We are, we are branches rooted in the line of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words will abide in us. So it is that we grow, nourished by invisible connections to the living God called to nourish that which is seen and that which is buried within. We gather for worship now to the glory of God. May we grow wildly as God tends us lovingly. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, we come before your throne of peace, not trusting ourselves, but in your marvelous and gracious love as it seeks expression among us. May we listen for your still small voice as it speaks to us today and as it boldly proclaims the undeniable reality of your love that will not let us go. Stir our hearts and our imaginations that we may see beyond the appearances of what is to the reality of what can be. Teach us to love each other as you have loved us. In the name and spirit of Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen.
Our first reading is from the Gospel of John, thir verse, uh, chapters 13 and 15, selected verses. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. As you are able and comfortable this morning, please stand with me and let us pray together our prayer of confession as can be found printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Loving and merciful one, we thank you for the community in which you have placed us, for the brothers and sisters with, with whom we walk this pilgrim journey. Even in our gratitude, we confess that we fail to love as you love. We wittingly and unwittingly push aside those whom we believe are the least in your kingdom. We fail to see your kingdom in parables because we fail to see your kingdom in each other. Form in us a new vision of unity in which there is neither east nor west, neither south nor north, we pray for the sake of your kingdom, that both is and is not yet. Amen. Friends, in love and compassion, God calls us back to the beauty that is indeed deep within our souls. By God's By grace, grace, we are made whole. Hallelujah. Amen. May the God of new life restore and make new our life together. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share signs of God's peace with one another.
Thank you to our very own Paul Powell for the words of that hymn. And now our second reading for this morning comes from Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. If you are following along in your pew Bible, that is on page 934. And Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. Now, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, though, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Amen.
On a day filled with so much gratitude, it is easy to name our gifts and the ways that we feel particularly undeservedly blessed. And it is my prayer that in this time of offering, we might feel connection to one another in God, trusting that God knits us together as we share our gifts of time and passions and curiosity and even, yes, of our financial resources, that somehow together God can do more with us than we ever ask or imagine. So in that spirit, may we prepare ourselves for a time of giving as our ushers come forward now. As we enter into prayer, I always like to remind us there are all kinds of things we bring with us into this space, things that are worrying us and troubling us on our minds and hearts, things are exciting us and distracting us that this hour is just standing between us and whatever that next celebration might be. Heartbreak for the world, ache for need and longing, injustices here and far away. I ask that you not be distracted by those things, but allow them into this space, knowing that together we hold them gently in prayer. Let's hold some silence and call it sacred for just a moment, and then I will bring us out in a spoken word. Let us pray together, friends. On this day of transition, O oh God, we give thanks for what was 
and is and is to come. We look behind us and see the work of your hands, the leading of your spirit, the way the winding path of Jesus has taken us. Beneath our feet now, we feel the security of this place holding us tenderly in safety and affection in this sacred moment. But when we look ahead, the path is not as clear. We have not yet taken the first step and we fear, what if it is the wrong one? What if we miss the path? Assure us once again, O oh God, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a steady mind. Believing that to be true, in this breath, we release our anxiety into the sacred space of prayer. Hold it with us, O oh God and remind us in this moment of the poet's words, traveler, your footprints are the path and nothing more. Traveler, there is no path. The path is made by walking. By walking, the path is made. And when you look back, you'll see a road never to be trodden again. Make us bold, O oh God. Fill us with fire and passion and confidence. Strengthen our spines and speak to us in the pit of our bellies. Together, may we take the next step. Together, may we discover the path. And together, may we pattern our lives after our brother and our teacher, Jesus the Christ, forever and ever, again and again and again. It is with the steps of Christ before us, the Spirit's breath within us, and the love of God around us that we are bold to live just as we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
For those of you who like to track these sort of things, the sermon today is not being rooted in love. That is the sermon from last week, which you can find online and we can make available to you if you weren't here and you'd like to read it. The title for today's sermon is A Letter to the Church at St. Charles. I decided I'd go to the epistles for my final five sermons. After all, these are the letters from Paul and his partners and students to the small gathering of believers that had emerged as the church in the mid first century CE. In recent years, new church startups have even attempted to model themselves after what these letters showed the early church to be, gathering regularly together for prayer, eating together, worshiping together, sharing all things in common, making sure the needs of everyone in the community are met. It is ambitious to attempt forming your priorities and lives around those habits. Sometimes, especially for progressive folk, it is easy to ignore the letters because they either sound really antiquated or the disagreement around who authored each one casts a shadow over the validity of the epistle itself. If it's starting with a lie, it's got to be full of lies. Well, in these final weeks as senior pastor of the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church, a nearly 125 year old congregation that has been served by more pastors than we can remember by name, as well as associate pastors, youth ministers, children's ministers, ministers of education and community engagement, nursery workers who rocked babies and entertained toddlers, custodial staff who polished pews and spent hours each week vacuuming the sanctuary so it would be spotless on Sunday morning. That question of authorship is actually part of what draws me to the letters right now. I'm drawn to all of those co-workers as I stand here one last time as your pastor. Because of course, it was never just Paul. A lot of the time Paul was writing from prison and let's remember one more time that the theological is the political. He was a political prisoner because his teachings were anti-Roman. Think McCarthyism and the Red Scare, but make it faith-based anti-empire. There is a kingdom greater than Rome, he preached. There is one who is greater than Caesar, and that kingdom and that one deserve your singular allegiance and fidelity. Back to jail he goes with that sermon. But Paul had students and partners, co-workers and collaborators. He mentored and shared and co-labored with them. So sometimes Paul was writing to people he had never met directly, but he wrote to them due to their reputation or because of a relationship he had with another preacher who loved them. In the case of letters being attributed to Paul, that was also a common practice in the first century when the more famous author was being honored as a tribute. It's not an attempt to hide something, but to identify which movement you're a part of. To say, I am of Paul is a little something like when a few of us who still hold on to the name Baptist refer to ourselves as Jimmy Carter Baptists. Even if we never traveled to Plains, Georgia and sat in his Sunday school class at Maranatha Baptist Church, we know the teachings that have come through the tradition that formed that gentle social justice warrior. To be Baptist in the name and way of Jimmy Carter says a lot about how we might be Christian in the name and way of Jesus even if it only says that to half a dozen of us in here. So sometimes people attributed their writings to the tradition of Paul, even if Paul himself had nothing to do with it. They're saying, I'm part of this group. Lastly, I admire the collaborations Paul names in his ministry settings, never attempting to take all the credit for himself, calling Aquila, Priscilla, and Titus my fellow co-workers working closely with Barnabas, Silas, Epaphroditus, and Timothy. His relationship with Timothy evolves across the New Testament to one of, the, one of complete pastoral 
partnership, almost a first century co-pastorate, if you will. If Paul cannot be there, he sends someone to teach and pray and lead just as he himself would. If Paul and Timothy have been traveling together when Paul is writing, they send greetings to a church they love, even if they didn't actually sit down and pin that letter together. But they're collaborators and colleagues, so they write in one voice. This is ideally how healthy pastors function in healthy communities, sharing values and teaching, supporting and affirming one another, cheering one another on, respecting each other's skills and giftedness and authority. That is why this congregation boasted membership and preachers the likes of Will Campbell, Theodore Clark, who caused a tremendous stir at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in the 1940s when he published a book saying that the life of Jesus might just be as or more significant than the death of Jesus. Frank Stagg, Malcolm Tolbert, Myron Madden, who went on to launch the first clinical pastoral education program in New Orleans at Baptist Hospital. Bill Rogers, another NOBTS professor, once interim pastor here in this pulpit and a great mentor and friend to me ever since I officiated his mother's funeral in 2003 at Baptist Church of the Covenant. This is of the Bill and Marie Rogers family. Fisher Humphreys, also Baptist Church of the Covenant, was here and preached and taught, a beloved friend and mentor of mine, a theologian at large. And more recently, Pastor Amy Butler, who many of you still know and love and keep in touch with. Honoring the unique giftedness of these individuals, often ordaining them here, inviting them to lead and preach and then blessing them and sending them out again has been a tremendous part of this church's identity. I was lucky enough to experience such collegial relationships with Stephanie Coyne and Timmy Love Moon, both of whom we ordained here in my time. And it is finally, at long last, I have gotten to enjoy, enjoy that same kind of collegial relationship with my friend Mark Boswell. So if Mark and I were to write an epistle as a ministry team, it would begin something like this. Elizabeth and Mark, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at St. Charles, together with the leadership team and diaconate, grace and peace to you from God, our source, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the letter would move to some kind of blessing, maybe the kind that we find in Philippians chapter one. I thank my God for every remembrance of you always in every one of my prayers for all of you praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now i'm confident of this that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of christ jesus it is right for me to think this way about all of you because i hold you in my heart for all of you are my partners in god's grace both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with full knowledge and insight to help you determine what really matters. So that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. After that blessing, the body of the letter would articulate the message the sender most wanted to convey to that community, sometimes speaking into conflict, sometimes calling out the church veering in the wrong direction, culturally or politically, and sometimes reminding them of who they are when they are at their best together as a people. If it was a community well known within his ministry circle, he might write something like this. I have heard from my brothers and coworkers, Avery and Stephen, 
your ministers and messengers of the good work you have done in your city. They have spoken of your devotion to meeting together for worship and study, commitment to excellence in both, as well as your passion for justice in the world. I have heard of Lanny Goldfinch's presence at the McCrory's lunch counter sit-ins and his arrest alongside Aretha Castle Haley, Jerome Smith, Rudolph Lombard, and others. Despite being hung in effigy on Tulane's campus and removed from the graduate program where he was studying philosophy, Lanny never lost his passion for social justice and making trouble. I give thanks to God for this legacy among you. As our brother in Christ, John Lewis, always said, do not get lost in the sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not a struggle of a day or a week or a month or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Lanny wasn't afraid, and you, like I, so admired him for that. And you have made some noise. You have gotten in good and necessary trouble. While so many churches around you question the role of women in the church, you were the first in the state to welcome the sisterhood to full leadership and service by the ancient ritual of ordination, laying on hands, calling out giftedness, setting apart for service to the diaconate, beloveds like Mary Brown, and as ministers, Judy Nelson and Dion Aim. You have stood firm in the whisperings of the Holy Spirit, reminding you that there is that of God in each of us. And these women have led the church at St. Charles more fully and more deeply than you ever would have experienced without them. Your reputation is known far and wide for your work in founding New Orleans Baptist Hospital, your decades of support of the former New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, your partnership with RAIN and later the No AIDS Task Force to grow in friendship, affection, and support of those living with HIV and AIDS. I have heard of the wide welcome you have continued to offer all of the LGBTQIA community, including the full ordinances of baptism and communion, as well as ordination and marriage. You have practiced welcoming all people as beloveds made in the image of God. The good work you have begun right here in your own community has spread to the world around you. So never tire of doing good, even if it stirs up trouble. In fact, that may just be how you know you are on the right path. But you have not let the past be the only thing that defines you, as some are in the habit of doing. We give thanks for the legacies of those who came before us, and we honor their legacies by picking up the baton and running the next leg of the race. You have continued your hard work for good with the annual crop hunger walks, food for thought at Audubon Charter School, membership and connection with Together New Orleans, stand with dignity and the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice in hosting warrant clinics, delighting with PFLAG and a Sunday afternoon fundraiser drag show, marching in solidarity with Muslim neighbors and undocumented asylum seekers even interrupting ICE when they are attempting to deport people. I have heard of your continued study, taking you deep into the realities of racism and white supremacy, your awakening to the horrors of the criminal legal system, and your valiant attempt to repair the tremendous harm caused by both. Sometimes it is tempting to turn your head and look away when you happen upon so much suffering. Do not give up. Continue to persist in your work with the St. Charles Center for Faith and Action, which you created. Persist together in lifting up those who have been left out and let down by the world's hate and fear. 
Even in your gathering place at 7100 St. Charles Avenue, you have opened your doors and welcomed therapists and recovery groups, youth organizations, nonprofit organizers, and faith communities to serve and welcome and live and move in the space you have loved for so long. When the temptation to preserve buildings as museums is strong, your will to do good has been stronger. I tell the churches around me of your good work and inspiring vision, keeping these doors open and opening them wider and wider still. It is hard, but you are doing so well. Do not give up. Do not give up on this hard work of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Do not give up on meeting and worshiping and praying together. You must stay in the habit of sitting together in sacred silence, cultivating those practices within yourself and within the collective that anchor and root and grow us. You must do these things if there is any hope at all of being a beacon of light and love for this world. Remember our co-laborer, Martin Luther King Jr., who said, as our eyes look to the future, as we look out across the years and across the generations, let us develop and move right here. We must discover the power of love, the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make this old world into a new one. Do not give up hope that this old world can be made new. Do not give up on serving one another in love, being present to each other's needs, and holding space in the messy reality of life. Do not give up your abiding hope that love always wins. Do not cut corners or compromise what you know matters most. Do the hard work of love and trust that God goes with you on that narrow road. The stories of your past may lend you courage and strength, but they do not permit you to abandon the work in your own generation ever. And I sure do wish I could be with you on the journey ahead, but I cannot. How I will always remember with joy and pride my time with you in New Orleans. It is the hope of Christ and firm belief in the path of justice. Well, she tried without her reading glasses and failed. It is in the hope of Christ and firm belief in the path of Jesus. I affirm the one who is coming to you, and I know he, like myself, will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And so many seek their own interests. So many seek the cheap shortcuts of pop theology and church fads. But Mark Boswell seeks the narrow way of Jesus the Christ. How like a brother he is to me. As side by side, we have served in the work of the gospel. We have grieved and laughed and shaken our heads and welcomed surprise in our short time working together. We believe that God really can do more than you and I ever ask or imagine. Knowing he will be with you makes my heart less anxious as I face my own next chapter. So welcome him, my brothers and sisters, in the Lord with all joy and honor the work of the spirit that is steadily moving in him. I will hold you in my hearts in prayer, knowing that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it as you are faithful to the mysterious ways of God's work in the world. I leave Mark with you my coworker, my partner, my brother. Love him, affirm him, listen to him and let him be your pastor and trust that his gifts and skills 
and deep knowledge and tremendous talents will guide you well on this next leg of your journey. I'll keep my words brief today, as brief as could reasonably be expected from a Baptist preacher. <laughs> they will be. I would like to say, like the Apostle Paul, that I do and will continue to thank God every time that I remember you. When I wrote this opening sentence yesterday for this manuscript, I paused a bit because I had to ask myself whether the you that I am remembering and am thankful for was intended in my mind for Elizabeth or for St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. Of course, I'm thankful for both you, Elizabeth, and for all of you, the congregation at St. Charles, but the brief pause that I felt reminded me that I personally have not known Elizabeth apart from her role as senior pastor of St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church, and I have not personally ever known St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church apart from having Elizabeth as your senior pastor. Both of your identities, to me at least, have been entwined together around your shared work for the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth. I share this today because I realize and I appreciate and I want to foreground the depth of the emotional shifts that are occurring and will continue to occur both as Elizabeth steps into new open spaces of her identity beyond her role as senior pastor of this congregation. And as this congregation moves into and shapes and tends the open spaces in front of us in what will be the life of this church. For you, the congregation, some of you remember several pastors who have stood in this pulpit. Some of you, though, have only ever known Elizabeth as the senior pastor who stands in this pulpit. No matter who you are, bear in mind that sometimes in the face of change, we want to hold fast to someone and not let them go even after they're gone because to do so would mean having to sit with feelings that are tender or difficult. And sometimes in the face of change, we want to hurry and be done with it and not look back because in the looking back, we may have to acknowledge feelings that are tender and difficult to sit with. In one way or another, we are all experiencing a loss today. It might be the loss of a friendship or a trusted pastoral presence or the stability of Elizabeth's strong leadership on Sunday mornings. How you respond to that loss as an individual or a congregation, either holding on or looking ahead or a mixture of both, I pray that we all do so going forward with tenderness, to each other with compassion for ourselves and with thanksgiving for this period of our lives, this period of Elizabeth's life, this season of ministry that has shaped our life together as a congregation and personally my own sense of calling and belonging to a people of faith named the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. But lest I spend too long talking about tender emotions, let us say for today in good New Orleans fashion that we shall celebrate even as we know loss, that we shall give thanks in the midst of however this transitional liminal space feels for you, and we shall move forward with a good spirit, trusting and believing the good and the old words that all shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of things indeed shall be well. Amen.
I shall also keep our announcements brief today because we have more that is coming. And also, as you can find everything you need about our upcoming events in your paper bulletin and also in yesterday's e-bulletin and also on the website, it is everywhere. A few things to highlight though. First, instead of gathering behind you for refreshments this morning, we'll gather instead in the fellowship hall where we'll have a reception and continue our time of celebrating Elizabeth's ministry here at St. Charles along with her family who we're very glad to have today. Second, this upcoming Thursday night, we will have Theology on Tap at Bruno's Tavern over on Maple Street at 6 p.m. Feel free to come to that if you would like. And third, this upcoming Saturday, we'll have our band book fair, talk about good trouble. Our band book fair will be in the Fellowship Hall. We're co-hosting this with Blue Cypress Books, and that will be from 2 to 5 p.m. We are in need of some volunteers to help with setup and probably clean up and baking some homemade goods. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to Nancy Sanders for more information or to sign up for that. These are all good things. And now for Elizabeth, we will have a few presentations. The first one will be from a representative of the leadership team. And following that, we will have a presentation by Kathy Randalls. Pastor Elizabeth, you gave us the most wonderful message, a letter to the members of St. Charles Avenue Baptist <laughs> Church. We, in turn, have a letter for you from the leadership team. Our dearest Pastor Elizabeth, you came to us on that morning in September, a Sunday, and to be exact, the 15th day in the year of our Lord, 2013. On that day, we found ourselves listening to a person who filled the sanctuary with the richness of her presence. You told us about your love for Jesus and your belief in the Jesus way. Oh, we were drawn to you, and personally speaking, as a preacher's kid, and hearing the stories of preachers being led to their post by God and being extremely skeptical of that idea. I found myself amazed on that September day, acknowledging that God had sent Pastor Elizabeth to us. A mere two months later, you became the first female pastor of a Baptist church in Louisiana. You came to us full of opinions, firmly delivered, and absolutely unassailable. You have tirelessly spoken to us about the love of Jesus and your love for humanity, or at least some of the humanity. We saw your soul broken on that Wednesday in November 2016 after learning the results of the presidential election and your fear of how the nation's hearts and lives could be changed. Jeff Brumley in 2019 wrote an article in the Baptist News Globe, in Baptist News Globe labeling you as a gutsy female pastor something we already knew. Your leanings have guided us through new pathways by helping us pursue community partnerships, new programs such as the Center for Faith and Action, and it helped us to establish St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church as a national treasure. Pastor Elizabeth, as a representative of the church leadership team, I want you to know that it has been a joy working with you. The leadership team shall deeply miss you, but recognize that it is time for us to share you with others. You will bring incredible generosity to the world and to the lives of others. Nathan, Turner, and Jay, we will miss you. It has been brilliant watching Jay and Turner grow up. Nathan, what can we say? Thank you for sharing your time as an active member on numerous work committees within this church, and especially our deepest appreciation for making the tax credits a reality as we pursue our goal of making St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church a sacred place for all. And now, dearest Elizabeth, we wish you fond farewell.
Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Pastor Elizabeth, the final sermon was even better than the first. So we thank you so much. Over the past 10 years at St. Charles, there have been, <clears throat> excuse me, countless memories to remember, jazz worship services, inspired sermons, Christmas Eve in the courtyard, Easter around the flower cross. And every Sunday, without exception, we knew that you would present a beautifully prepared worship service with an insightful message from above. Of course, there has also been uh, many challenges of COVID, of leaky roofs and flaking pastures, uh, and, and the many things that come with a 100-year-old building. But we thought it would be appropriate as a gift to you that we frame some of the photos of, um, of your time here, and we also, inscribed on, these, uh, on the frame a blessing, which I would like to read. And this, this blessing extends to Elizabeth's family as well as Elizabeth. Pastor Elizabeth, with the steps of Christ before you, the Spirit's breath within you, and the love of God around you, we wish you joy in the challenges ahead. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. In Christ, St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church, September, 2023. Madam Pastor, may I ask you to go sit on the front row, please? <laughs> and Madam Pastor's family, biological family, and or close, close family, not the whole church, y'all. But uh, your close, close family, could y'all please come sit on the front row with Madam Pastor? Thank you. <laughs> Ooh. Dear Pastor, Dear Elizabeth, you and therefore we are on the cusp of shifting from title to name, role to human, pastor to friend. I open with both because I have used both when addressing you these past 10 years. I will probably continue to use both long into the future. My tongue will slip or the part of me that has been screaming, no, don't go, <laughs> since you made your announcement a month ago, will win out. Hey, Pastor, I mean, hi, Elizabeth. I use both because I have always used both with you, because you have always been both to me and my family and our congregation. You have been the first woman pastor of a church that I am a member of. I know the saints have already started, y'all, and I'm just going to claim my role as a Baptist, another PK in the house, and I'm take my time because, y'all, this woman deserves our time. This summer, I went to Turkey for a recording session in Istanbul with some amazing collaborators from Art to Action. And afterwards, some of us went to some ancient biblical sites, home to some of these ancient letters from Paul, namely Ephesus. I walked through the city that Paul wrote to, y'all, and I went to Cappadocia, what? Now, most of y'all know that I have been doing some intense walking with Paul these last several years, especially to Damascus. My road trip buddy to this holy land was an amazing opera and folk singer from Syria named Lubana Al-Kuntar. She has an apartment in Damascus that she hasn't been able to visit since she left the country and her parents. 10 years ago, and she really wanted to go to Cappadocia. 
and one of the main attractions in Cappadocia is the balloon ride over Turkey's Grand Canyon. Has, have any of you seen, been to Cappadocia? Raise your hand, am I the only one in the house? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all are going very soon. You need to take everybody else, especially Elizabeth, with you next time you go, Nathan. Okay, anyway, so we were terrified but compelled to take that ride. We had to get up at 3 a.m. We put on extra layers because it was gonna be cold up there. We spent money that we didn't really have to see the view of this amazing part of the world from the heavens with no window and no loud horsepower motor ruining the view. Just fire, helium, a balloon, a basket, and get this, there's a reason I'm telling y'all this long tale, a woman pilot. As we were elevating up off the ground, after watching the hour long process of watching the balloon get attached and filled, out by a t filled up by a team of about 10 mostly men, the one woman I had noticed working on the inflation is standing there in the center of the basket and she welcomes us and tells us that she was the first woman air, hot air balloon pilot in Turkey. And now there are 15 women along with 500 male pilots. But that is progress. Lubana and I looked at one another and laughed with glee and immediately sent this information to our director, Andrea and our colleagues, Elam, Ida, and Gabby, with whom we've been talking about the challenges of being a woman musician or a woman theater artist over the whole time we were in Istanbul recording. We made it to heaven for real. So back to earth, back home. If that fleeting glee was great, imagine my glee upon witnessing that the church I started attending after Katrina with my parents, after the church my father and mother and our family served for over 50 years was usurped by some well-meaning church planters from afar. When my father won out and we started attending liberal St. Charles Avenue Baptist instead of conservative Metairie Baptist, my mother had preferred. I felt like God herself had sprinkled sweet light rainbow rain on my head when St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church called a woman to be our pastor. What rubjous joy, kalu kale. And she has delivered. You, dear pastor, have delivered in so many ways. To continue being selfish with my words and this moment this morning, I want to say that you have been the perfect pastor for me these past 10 years. You gave me a space to question this beautiful messed up denomination of Christianity that all of us in this room have inherited. And you also gave me a space to continue worshiping in this container with my mom, my much more conservative parents. You created a space where our ideological collisions could coexist and still feel at home, at one. And you ministered to them and me and my family throughout dad's long walk to the pearly gates and my mom's fast train. And you delivered both of their memorial services, one huge, grand, and glorious one for Papa that 50 years worth of his relationships rolled up into this joint, and one for my mother in the early days of COVID, when even you hadn't set foot in this sanctuary to do your pastorly duties for months. You came, you masked, you created space for me and our family members to celebrate dear Eloise. You gave me a space to see God as female and male and genderless and genderful. You modeled inclusivity to any and all who seek to enter these doors. Radical hospitality, especially to our LGBTQIA plus family members who have been deeply scarred by other Baptist churches. You baptized my daughter and your son in the same water on the same day, who were in the same class at the same school for six years. 
and we were co-parents at our small but cool youth group. You said yes to the fabulous Halloween lock-in that happened all over the church. Yes, I literally mean we visited every nook and cranny of this church that night. And then you said yes to the graduates, the ensemble of formerly incarcerated women that I co-direct and, and, and you hosted here on several occasions, including a full week-long summit with 100 people walking in and out of multiple spaces in this church. You saw the building falling apart, you smelled the mold, you saw the dollar signs for repairs mounting, and at the same time you had us read books like The New Jim Crow, White Too Long, and Should I Stay Christian? And you combined these seemingly disparate factors and followed the genius spark of divine inspiration that led us to the Fund for Sacred Places and ultimately the St. Charles Center for Faith and Action. And you've been co-leading retreats here in this sacred place for people of faith beyond our congregation. And you've begun to take all of this amazing work to people in other cities all over the country through Indeed and Truth, I dat. And finally, in case y'all don't know, Elizabeth really shepherded me through the creation of the road to Damascus as told by grandmother to Little Red. It was your encouragement of questioning the faith of our fathers, your encouragement of braiding the disparate strands of freeing Mama Glow and all of my work, years of work at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women together with ancient biblical stories that we both grew up with, your encouragement that the Bible can and should be used to illuminate our current most difficult life struggles and that it is okay to let our current struggles question the gospel we were taught to hold as stone truths from our childhood. And your attending of several rehearsals and the final performance and deep brief meetings, I was able to create that piece that hopefully I'm gonna do here in November, y'all. Dear Pastor, dear Elizabeth, this is what you've done for me and my family these past 10 years. Now multiply that by everyone in this church today and on Zoom today, and those who chose to leave, and those who had to leave, and those who have departed to heaven, and those who are not yet born. And then multiply that number by at least 30, because when you touch one person, you also touch their relationships with their family members and their loved ones and their co-workers and their frenemies and their strangers that we all encounter in our daily lives. Know that your ripple here and this sacred place will be felt into the eternity of all of our lives. I thank you. We thank you. Now, uh, just to give y'all something to do besides sit there and be tired of listening to me talk and everybody else talk, um, I'd like to ask um, the four of you younger members of the family to move this table over to the side and I'm going to get the candles. Okay, now I would like to ask um, you to come forward, my pastor, my friend, into this space and to stand at the altar. Mrs. Mango, Jay Turner, Nathan. <laughs> Actually, for this part, I still need you to face me. I'm sorry, I'll be selfish a little bit longer. Sorry, y'all. Mark, it's all Mark's fault, he asked me to do this. We all know that behind and around this great woman is a great mother, a great husband, and two beautiful children. And we use children, you know, in the sense of a mother and her, because I know, and Emma would kill me if I called either of y'all children, because y'all are no longer children, but you will always be their children. Um, so is this a eulogy? 
a baptism or a wedding? Where the heck am I taking, y'all? I don't know, but I'm about to reveal. The first one is a wedding. I ask, do you, Elizabeth, take you, Elizabeth, to be your lawfully wedded wife? No, your lawfully wedded self. And do you, Mama Mega, Margaret, Nathan, Turner, and Jay, take your mother, wife, and mom back from us? Great. Let the church say amen. amen. Now I would like to ask everyone else to come forward, including the choir and the other PK in the house, Yes, I would like to ask y'all to come on forward, come forward, come into this holy space. It is transitioning from a church to a theater to, uh, I don't know what, but I want y'all to come on forward. And um, <laughs> Elizabeth's going to kill me, y'all. She's going to kill me. I would like to ask at this moment, for y'all to come real close because I want you to lay hands on Elizabeth. Now, you can lay hands on her head, her back, her arms, and as you might notice, you might not all be able to touch her, so if you touch someone who is touching Elizabeth on the head, back, or arms, you are connected. I want everybody to physically connect. Yes, I do. Sorry. Come on, come on. And my Zoom people, I want y'all to spiritually connect and send your energy into this space right here, right now. So um, as we're gathering, if you can hear me while you're walking, this part is the eulogy. And I would like to invite you now, each of you, to say in one sentence, one thing you're grateful for that Elizabeth has done for you or yours. And I want you to say it loud enough for the people on Zoom to hear. And Zoom folks, if you want to say something, we want to hear you. You're, you're, I've been told by the tech man that um, y'all are plugged in and loud, so you can be heard. Um, but only one sentence, because as we know, the saints have already started. One sentence from anybody who feels so moved. And no, y'all, this, this is your chance to say it. Is there one more word that anybody didn't get a chance to say? Elizabeth, thank you for bringing the jazz music to the church. And then the choir will follow with the choral benediction. Elizabeth, have at it.